a big welcome to World of Sport. A few days ago, we lost a mate, a man we grew up to love and respect. Here in his study, in the home he lived in for so many years, you get a feel for Ron Casey. He was a broadcaster extraordinaire, a television administrator, a sporting visionary, a footy club chairman, and primarily a family man. Over the years, Ron Casey met the big names in sport and in life, but he never lost the common touch. He was a man who gave me and so many of my colleagues the famous Casey red carpet ride into television. He was so often a source of information, always an inspiration. He was our ultimate role model. In truth, he touched so many of us in so many different ways, and over the next hour, we will present our tribute. To many, he was Ron Casey. To those in the world of sport, he was just Case. signature song, Casey's theme, in itself a television icon. Most people saw one side of Ron Casey, the business-like compere of World of Sport, whose stern facade frequently cracked watching the antics of a bevy of former great footballers. He was the boss, but Louis the Lip, Captain Blood Woofer and the accurate one Bill Collins often put him to the test. Case and his role as godfather just played along. But off camera, he was made of stern stuff. He expected loyalty, he fought hard for his principles, and he loved a scrap. No sporting event has divided Australia like the 1980 Moscow Olympics. In protest over the Russian invasion of Afghanistan, the Americans bowed to the wishes of President Jimmy Carter and elected to boycott the Games, as did the West Germans and the Japanese. Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser and England's Margaret Thatcher supported the US boycott but, under intense pressure, allowed the athletes to decide themselves. Not so subtle pressure was brought to bear on Seven's exclusive coverage. The man under fire would be Seven's general manager, Ron Casey. Early in 1980, two major supporters, National Panasonic and the Commonwealth Bank, wilted under the federal government-led barrage and withdrew their $2.4 million sponsorship. Casey decided that Seven would cover the shortfall and go on regardless. Casey had put Seven's coverage together over the previous years. He had visited Moscow on several occasions and filed reports for World of Sports. And I've got to ask you, are you confident of winning the gold medal in 1980 in basketball? Oh, <laughs> it's rather a difficult question, of course. In just over 90 minutes from now, Lord Kalalan, president of the IOC, will invite Leonid Brezhnev, head of the Soviet government, to declare open the games of the 22nd Olympia. was not coping well. However, at the moment, it's just a little past midnight in, uh, uh, in uh, Eastern Australia, not quite uh, midnight in Moscow, but when it is midnight in Moscow, this is the way...
The winner is the Moscow Olympics, the seven net. Case was never one to pass up an opportunity at the microphone. If any of the young people who are watching those telecasts are inspired to bigger and better performances and represent Australia in 1984 in Los Angeles, our job was well done. Yeah. Thank you very much. Ron Casey's association with the Olympic Games had begun in Melbourne some quarter of a century earlier. He often joked that the TV rights had been a bargain at 80 quid. But then again, with television in its infancy, only a few people had sets, and those who did became everyone's best friends. In 1960, Casey was in Rome. He watched Herb Elliott smash the world 1500 metres record, and along the way, staged his own major sporting coup. With the American CBS network tying up the TV rights, Casey had Perth cameraman Digby Milner shoot the opening ceremony from the grandstand in the Stadio Olimpico. One of Casey's mates held the Qantas flight from Rome to Australia for 40 minutes, while a motorcycle delivered the raw film and a steward carried the film back home. Seven had the action on 48 hours ahead of a furious ABC. In Tokyo, four years later, he called the men's marathon from monitors in the main stadium. Abibi Bakila of Ethiopia successfully defended his Olympic title. Once again, Casey spirited the film on board a Qantas flight to scoop his rivals. Mexico City, 1968. High altitude, black power. And the golden double to Australia's freestyle sprint star Michael Wendon. Casey was there for it all. His favourite story was recounting the boasts of the American network, who had asked for US superstar Don Shalanda's certain gold in the 200 metres freestyle be rescheduled to hit peak viewing times on the east coast of America. The 18-year-old Wendon beat him and broke the Olympic record. Casey understood the Olympics. He had long accepted Australians' love of the purest and most intense international competition. In Munich in 1972, he put that judgment to the test. Seven and the ABC provided a joint venture coverage. As in Mexico, Sydney's Rex Mossop and Melbourne's Casey spearheaded the Seven team in the Olympics, remembered for the golden triumphs of Shane Gould in the pool, but overshadowed by the massacre of 11 Israeli athletes by Palestinian terrorists. The games were suspended for 34 hours and a memorial service was planned for the main stadium. While Casey urged his counterparts at the ABC to share a pool coverage of the moving ceremony, they refused. So he decided to go alone. It was a very, very emotional ceremony, he often recalled. It was on at seven o'clock at night and it rated a massive 35. Montreal was a disappointment to everyone associated with it. From a host city plagued by poor planning and corruption that almost went bankrupt, to the boycott of the African nations, to Australia's dismal performance. The games were in colour, the opening and closing ceremonies were beamed home live, and Casey decided that this would be the last time Seven would indulge in a pool coverage. In Moscow, they would go alone. There would be Winter Olympics too, for the first time, an Australian TV network purchased the rights to the Winter Games. And while the Aussies didn't stand a snowball's chance in Hell of Gold, we were there thanks to Ron at Lake Placid in 1980 and in Sarajevo in 84. And there it is. There Seven it is. successive Summer beautiful, Olympic Games, and there was one last dream, to again host the Olympic Games in Melbourne. That's Ron on the left. Ron Casey would be at the forefront of Melbourne's bid. It would be unsuccessful despite his attempts to sway the voting delegates of the IOC. In years to come, Casey would protest Melbourne's loss all the way to one Antonio Samaranch. He saw injustice with Atlanta's win and couldn't resist the opportunity to mention it. I think there was a feeling throughout the organisation that we were not getting 100% support for Melbourne's bid. Right to the head now by Rays. So he found himself in Barcelona in 1992, back where he felt he belonged. Next to a world champion, Jeffrey Hitman Harding, calling the boxing. For Case, this was bliss. Casey was born in Ballarat on December the 28th, 1927. 
His dad worked in the railways and they moved around a bit as young Ron grew up. Radio was his love, sport always his passion. So in August 1944, as a 16-year-old, Ron walked into 3DB and asked for a job. He had a stutter and worked in the transcription department before being trained as a turntable operator. It was only when he worked under the great sporting commentator, Eric Welsh, that he finally got his chance. As a youngster, he'd called the epic Davis Cup encounters at Kuyong on radio, thrilling to the exploits of Australia's favourite tennis kids, Lou Hode and Ken Rosewall. Twenty years later, as general manager of HSV7, Casey was instrumental in winning the television rights for the Australian Open. By then, the weak link in the Grand Slam, and really trailing far behind Wimbledon, the French, and also US Open. In 1975, Seven's team was at Kuyong, the new home of the Open, as John Newcomb and Jimmy Connors staged one of the great finals. Seven had urged the LTAA to make Melbourne the home base for the Open, and it has been ever since. It was in bad years. The Women's Open was played separately, and the facilities at Kuyong were deteriorating. Yet Casey had great faith in the sport and the LTAA. Later, Tennis Australia repaid that faith. He had remembered those Davis Cup days as Harry Hopman's world beaters held the cup year after year in the 50s. The Davis Cup would be part of the seven sporting stable. Tennis would be revitalised. The Australian Open had regained its place of honour in the Grand Slam standings. It is arguably Australia's greatest annual sporting event. Case was never a great golfer, as this rare picture shows an awkward stance, and an ungainly putting style. Huntingdale was his club, and when the Australian Masters began to struggle at the start of the 80s, Casey urged Channel 7 to buy in. Seven would take over the television rights from the ABC and transform it into a major golfing event in this country. Seven's coverage of golf became a yardstick worldwide and would embrace the Australian Open and many other major events as well. Here he is, opening tee shot. Yeah. Of course, he knocked it out of bounds at the first on Thursday, and that really got him off on the wrong leg. Played very well yesterday. His putter let him down again. Sport had always Three. been Ron Casey's Go. passion. One. Be it trackside, Two. calling pro running, at the board track, at the Olympic Velodrome, or out covering a cycling race on the road, he was in his element. Strangely, when you asked him about his proudest moments over his 15-year tenure at the helm in South Melbourne, Casey always pointed to Seven's groundbreaking advances in local drama. Seven was the first station to make an Australian miniseries. It was Against the Wind in 1978. Others would quickly follow. There would be The Last Outlaw, the Emmy Award-winning A Town Like Alice, All the Rivers Run, Cash and & Co and Tandara. And then of course, locally produced dramas like Cop Shop and Skyways. Casey had a feel for what people wanted to watch. Very, very astute showman. You can trust his judgment, uh, but much more important than that, you can trust the man. Lou Richards might have been made King of Moomba and a right royal king he was, but Ron was made Victorian of the Year and was staggered by the honour. After his retirement from Seven on Friday the 13th of February 1987, Casey said he planned to play a lot of golf. Well, we'd seen him in action, and the truth is, the clubs had become as rusty as the swing. There was too much to do and too little time to do it. He'd joined the board of Mornington Race Club, become chairman of the Harness Racing Board, try and steer Victorian boxing in the right direction and join the boards of Vic Health and Radio 927. Retirement just didn't suit his style. The of Ronald P. Casey. Fame back in 1996, only one television man was inducted. Ron Casey was a standout for his contributions over 40 years. Some would argue that he turned football into a television sport alone. Perhaps he certainly was its pioneer. He will be remembered for live telecasts of the Brownlow Medal since 1970, the introduction of lights at Waverley in 1977, the advent of a successful night competition, 
live telecasts of the grand final for the past 23 years, and a plethora of football shows that owe their existence to a remarkable television institution called World of Sport that changed our lives. Another man was inducted to the Hall of Fame on that night. He also is called Ron, a football legend, Ron Barassi. You can watch them, you can call them, but until you've been part of an AFL grand final yourself, well, it's a whole different thing altogether. In the last 10 years, Ron Casey discovered football has a different face. As chairman of the Kangaroos, he felt the bumps, enjoyed the wins, and positively reveled in the club's success. The love of North Melbourne had always been there, but in his role at 3DB in later Channel 7, he was the consummate fence sitter. The man who never betrayed his inner feelings for the club he loved. Let's turn back the clock, back to the early 50s, when like Ron, I was setting out to make a name in football. This is Ron in action, dapper, poised. At five foot seven in the old, a ready-made nuggety back pocket. Fortunately, he decided the comedy box was a safer haven and so he made it his own over the next 20 years. 3DB was the sporting station and was blessed with two of the great commentators. Bill Collins called the horses and in between, while Bill enjoyed a smoke and a bet, one would call the action at Brunswick Street or Arden Street, the MCG or Victoria Park. It was his association with a tough little Collingwood Rover named Richards that got the 3DB call up and running. They were a magical duo, the bookends of the future in Louis and Ron. Well, thank you, Ron, and thank you, Lou, for the wonderful job you've done throughout the season. We appreciate it tremendously. Ron would never regularly call football on television, but for years was the man who broke the biggest news stories on Channel 7. He was the first to broadcast the Brownlow on radio, and next morning would be outside the winner's home with a camera. How did you sleep last night? Well, I didn't, Ron. I was so uh, thrilled about uh, winning the Brownlow. And when I decided to take up coaching, he was there too. Today it became known that uh, Melbourne champion Ron Barassi is an applicant for the position of playing coach. He was a dedicated newsman with a nose for a story and most importantly, the implicit trust of the people involved. I was at the stage where I was uh, packing the bags, Ron, and I was definitely going. Grand final nights were always memorable. Ron and Lou honoured guests at the functions for both the winners and the losers. And the floor staff have put in some uh, money and we've decided to give you a camera to take home this week. Oh, a camera? Oh, that's tremendous. What about that refrigerator I'll be nine off up there, Luke? <laughs> Ron understood our love of the game. As far as he was concerned, Channel 7 couldn't give footy fans enough. Channel 7 executives glanced at Casey's idea of reading out the football teams on Thursday nights. He had done it for a decade on 3DB and knew there was interest. In league teams. The three wise monkeys were Casey's trusted football lieutenants, Davis, Richards and Dyer. The teams were quickly shoved aside though as other more important features took over. Oh, look, I love bangers and mash sausages, they are, friend. Well, they are a what? big bag of sausages. Oh, 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 right. <laughs> the While he secretly loved the show, what? outwardly he fumed as a simple exercise like reading out the teams had turned into a major production. With wife Pauline, he became the butt of the jokes. The show gained cult status, although Casey kept the swollen heads of his presenters in check by pointing out the lowly ratings. In 1970, he convinced the VFL that the Brownlow medal count should be given greater prestige. While he had called the count at Harrison House in Spring Street for years on radio, he saw enormous television exposure, giving the game's greatest individual award the kudos it deserved. The Brownlow count is now football's night of nights. Hello everybody and welcome to this historic Brownlow medal count. Case was there to oversee the move from black and white to brilliant colour and understood the advantages sports of all sorts would have in the bright new medium. By the late 70s, as the VFL under the leadership of general manager Jack Hamilton moved out of the dark ages, Seven was poised to dramatically expand its coverage. Case was in the thick of it. He persuaded Seven's parent company, the Herald and Weekly Times, to fund the new lights at Waverley. Night football was born in 1977, and with it, our viewing habits would change forever. 
the biggest single obstacle in his way was the VFL's refusal to allow live telecasts of football against the gate in Melbourne. In 1977, he went to Jack Hamilton with an offer. Hamilton said Casey could go live if the North Melbourne Collingwood Grand Final was a sellout. Casey promptly purchased the last remaining standing room tickets and the battle was finally won. Well, oh, the pressure on this veteran from Collingwood played over 200 games. Fires for the goal. And he's put it through. Little did he realise that the game would end with the scores level and we all had to troop back a week later. Once again, Hamilton came to the party after a large sum of money was offered, and from that day on, the grand final has been seen live, not only in Melbourne, but around Australia, and in so many overseas markets as well. The wins hands down. There had to be an anthem. It would become a best-selling record. Up there Around the one day in September, he built viewing habits that linger. Friday night was a review of the season in the program. That was the season that was. Then the grand final marathon. An all-night affair with great last quarters of old matches that achieved cult status. And every year, grand final day begins with another Casey masterpiece, the North Melbourne Grand Final Breakfast. An institution that has grown, one dares to say, almost out of control. If you haven't got a seat on the world's longest top table, your social, sporting or political standing is not where it should be. Presiding over events, the master of ceremonies, Ron Casey. Ladies and gentlemen, we do hope that you enjoy this morning. We hope you enjoy this afternoon because it is one of the great days of Australian sport. Casey understood the need for live football into Melbourne. He battled for years, but failed to convince the VFL that it could only be for the long-term good of the game. While the Victorian Football Association had long enjoyed live Sunday coverage on Channel 10, Case was bristling. Finally, in the early 80s, he convinced the VFL that live coverage of reserve-grade matches from the Lakeside Oval would help counter the growing appeal of the VFA games. If there was a low light in Casey's career, it certainly had to be 1986 when Seven lost the football rights to Broadcom. It would mean the end of world of sport and the end of an association that had been unbroken for 30 years. Ron Casey's contribution to football could not be measured. More than any man, he made it accessible. He was a man with a vision, and when he left Seven, he decided it was time to wear his heart on his sleeve and he offered his services to North Melbourne. Men like Ron Casey, with his business background, his media savvy, and vast circle of influential friends and colleagues, don't walk into football clubs every day. Case was the footy reporter and commentator who rose to become one of the game's greats. And he became one of the game's great statesmen. The biggest mismatch in Australian television history. Ron Casey, Merv Williams and a bunch of little-known boxers from Melbourne's House of Stoush taking on the King, the perennial gold Logie winner, Graham Kennedy at 9.30 in TV prime time. Brash, audacious, call it what you like. The show was called TV Ringside and whilst it wasn't pretty and the production was a little rough and the fists flew freely, it became a Monday night institution. Peter Landy cut his commentating teeth at Festival Hall with these two doyens. It's great to have my old mate, uh, uh, Merv Williams, with me. Uh, not so much of the old, Not so much of the old. No. I'm sorry about that, Merv. Mm. Um, have a look at the two uh, old boxing buffs in all their sartorial splendour. Merv, the boxing writer from the Pink Comic, better known as the Sporting Globe, and Case, who'd give up a three-course meal to watch a good fight. Case was the consummate pro. Cool in the crisis, he'd honed his boxing skills, calling the fights for 3DB in the years before TV hit our shores. Georgie Brackett and Maxi Carlos among his favourites. Tens of thousands of kids around Melbourne and through regional Victoria huddled under the blankets listening to every jab and uppercut. Case with his sharp memory for facts and polished call. Now Merv was just a little bit more colourful. He had a saying for every occasion. He was cool. He was like a... As cool as the tip of a Laplander's nose. He never, he never got... The, excited for one moment and it was a rare but successful mix that lasted the best part of a decade tv ringside was case's baby he loved it and nurtured it he ran it with the efficiency 
that would make him the general manager of the station in years to come. Memories. How about Kahu Mahanga punching Tony Mundine so hard his mouth guard flew out of the ring? Left hook now by Mahanga. Hooked by Mundine. We met a succession of colourful characters who made Monday night one to stay at home. Well, with, of course, a couple of cold bottles of courage and the feet up. An icy cold Crest Lager, because Crest Lager is the rewarding lager brewed for men. Some were boxers, some fighters, and some just happy to make a few quid. Case loved them all. But, of course, there were the two golden-haired boys, the young gods of Australian boxing, and Case was with them every step of the way as they moved into the sporting stratosphere. And uh, Rose is going to put some pressure on the challenger in this 13th round. A beautiful right, and Gattelardi's down. A perfect right hand. Well, he was a class above Gattelardi tonight, but rankings are not. He's still got a long, long way to go before he climbs to the ring with the likes of Arrow. Oh, another couple of years, and you never know. In February 1968, Case was in Tokyo, calling the shots for seven, as Melbourne's own Lionel Rose wrested the world bantamweight title from Japan's fighting Harada. For the first time since Jimmy Carruthers nearly 20 years earlier, Australia had a world champ. All he wanted to do was to talk to Ron. Back in just a moment. Hurt. Others had different ideas. Eleven months later, we had a second world champ. Another Melbourne boy, Johnny Famisham, and his win against Jose Legra at London's Royal Albert Hall made him an instant superstar. Case didn't have to move from his seat. Come on, Johnny boy. Hello, Ron, how'd I go? All right, mate? Oh, I'm glad. Oh, look, I tried everything for Australia. Really, I did. Uh, one case he did what no one oh, before now, or since uh, has managed to do in this country. He took boxing into the lounge rooms. TV ringside gave the fight game prime time respectability. It was the first port of call for Brownlow medalists. None was more popular than Bobby Skilton in 1968. I'll tell you one thing, Bob. Here at TV ringside, I can say this honestly, you're amongst friends. <laughs> yeah, but I reckon I would have stopped it earlier. Ron showcased our young hopefuls and the world's best. There was one moment in the career of Ronald Patrick Casey that stood above all others. And that was the day the Brockton blockbuster, the former world heavyweight champ Rocky Marciano, dropped in on him at World of Sports. How do you rate Cassius Clay? Mm. At this time, I rate Clay, of course, the best in the country, in the world, as a heavyweight fighter. I don't really know how good he is. He has never been a hit on the chin with a good punch. If Cassius Clay had been a challenger for your world title, would you have been confident of retaining your title against Cassius Clay? Well, I certainly would have, uh, would have enjoyed a fight with Cassius Clay. He's, uh, he's what we call a perfect opponent. He's tall, he's big, he's rangy. He's on the style of a Joe Lewis. I'm talking about physically now. Uh, he has the same abilities, perhaps not as a great a left jab as Joe Lewis, but uh, certainly abilities uh, close to Joe Lewis. Uh, I can say again, I don't know how great this man is. He could possibly be a great fighter, and time will tell. Is Cassius Clay good for boxing? Yes and no. Uh, in the beginning, yes. When, when he first came around, he really uh, got the public excited. He was calling the round, knocking out his opponents at the exact round that he said he would. Have you ever done this? No, <laughs> I never could. <laughs> it just isn't that way. It isn't that easy. Uh, most of my fights were hard fights and tough fights, and uh, I didn't have the uh, same confidence that Clay has. But uh, in the beginning, Clay was uh, good for the game. I mean, he brought a lot, a lot of new life into boxing. Uh, I remember uh, people other than boxing fans were getting interested in this young loudmouth. And then uh, he overdid it. He talked a little bit too much, a little bit too long, and he talked about the wrong things. And when he brought his religion into the picture, it sort of changed the whole entire setup of boxing. Case regarded it as his signature interview, and the one over 72 years he was most proud of. The one we still talk about with all. Of World of Sport when it first went to air on Channel 7 back in 1959. Videotape didn't exist, and to be brutally honest, 
no one thought it would last. It replaced the test pattern, which was the usual fare on Saturday morning in those days, and electrical retailers' views suggested some kind of sports show. After an unspectacular 13-week run, it moved to the Sunday lunch spot the next year, and for the next 27 years, it became part of our lives. Ron Casey often winked when mentioning it was in the Guinness Book of Records as the world's longest-running sports show. Fact or fiction? Who really cared? On relay to 22 television stations throughout Australia, a big welcome to World of Sport. footy show. Manicato up. Keystone Town beaten. That's racing when your money's eaten. But right now, here's a very happy kangaroo. More or less, flushed with success. Sir Ronald Casey, MVMDMM, PKTSBA, UPG. As the years roll on, we all have different memories of world of sport. Some terrifying, some hilarious. But whichever way you look at it, this was a unique happening in Australian television. Keith Kirby. Hello, Doug, just drop the trousers over there. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how you lose your sense of direction, isn't it? <laughs> Kev, do you still believe... Now, where is Kev? Look at that. He's going to have to sprint. Are you going to sprint, Kev? You can come in between Jack and Bob. Just sit down, quietly. I haven't got a chair to sit down. down. We'll come in over here. Can they still make the five? Well, I certainly think so, Sandy, because uh, Collingwood... This was the Sunday paper before Melbourne had one. Yes, I agree with that. They did become arrogant, Bob. I don't think Hawthorne... It was a footy variety show. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ted. It was always an organised chaos, wasn't it? Hasn't changed today either, Ron. It was a bunch of good mates meeting for a chat with the local superstars. It was groundbreaking and provocative. And when you look back on it now, perhaps a little bit rough around the edges. But that's just the way Ron Casey liked it. Was Neil Roberts to forget to bring the film back from Sydney and Skeeter Cognan would go out and do a grand final uh, series of interviews and next morning you weren't too sure what, what was on the film at all. <laughs> There's one piece of film up there somewhere in the archives. Uh, I, think, I think it's taken 35 seconds for Skeeter to say magnificent. <laughs> but they were great times. Well, we can't go because we haven't got any balls. Ron had this thing about finding out who was the best. And on hand, the judging panel. Immaculate rather than articulate in this instance. With Bruce Andrew, Thorold Merritt, Jim Cleary, always on hand. Thanks, Bob. Bad luck on that last kick. But there's your check for five pounds from uh, Craven Filler. The greats have gathered for the first, the ultimate and long overdue world championship in handball. And win. And 41 and the tiebreaker, Barry Cable wins. Richmond playing North Melbourne. From Richmond, a number 10, Kevin Sheedy. And if we ran out of contests, well, we just made them up. To be fair, Ron Casey was the only man in the world who knew what touch ball was all about. How it was played or how it was scored, yet week after week in the 60s, he convinced the game's best footballers to put on their runners and play in our studios. Oh, a goal. Ian the Essendon anchor man in trouble down there. And where else on television would you find a tug-of-war championship? Richmond take it out and Richmond have won. Look at that Richmond team as they hit the deck, losing the snap and then fighting back all the way. And then there was the roller derby, with cyclists riding against each other in front of a massive and somewhat unwieldy clock. And he's going to win it as Hilton Clark comes to grief, trying just a little bit too much, and he's down. He's fallen. There was the quiz, and there was the woodchop. The O'Toole family converting vast forests of softwood into splinters, week after week, in the name of sport. World of Sport was about mateship. In most cases, Ron's mates. There was John Dobby talking about bowls. Bill Collins would put down his cigarette and his sandwich long enough to run through the racing. And gruff Herald Turf editor, Jack Elliott, would give the Victorian amateur turf club a serve week after week. And good old Rollo Roylance would agree with everything the other two said. 
Doug Ring would look after the cricket issues on the home front and later would stand down for Max Walker. Soccer got the short shift. Fred Villiers hurried in and Fred also hurried out as we prepared for the major football code in the town. Former Davis Cup player Colin Long looked after tennis and conducted a golf clinic with local professionals hitting off a mat into a makeshift net with the odd Dunlop 65 sent whistling around the studios. And there was the gravelly voice of Gus Mercurio extolling the virtues of boxer Barry Boy Michael week after week with Case nodding his head in agreement. Captain Blood, Jack Dyer, was reserved for special occasions at the opening of the show. Case was furious when Jack mumbled a few words following the murder of Tiger Skipper, Fred Swift. Jack mumbled an apology and said he'd left his new teeth at home. In one corner of the studio, standing guard over the Patra orange juice and the Ballantine chocolates would be Uncle Doug. Big, brassy and bold, as befitting the Labour member for Dutagala in the upper house of the Victorian Parliament. If Case was the heart of World of Sport, then Uncle Doug Elliott was its spruker. Ah, oh, he's beautiful. He's absolutely beautiful. The best interviewer of a sports nature that the show ever had. People watched World of Sport for a whole bevy of reasons, but in honesty, the footy was the magnet. The biggest names congregated week after week to ruminate and vegetate. And there was none bigger than Lou Richards and Jack Dyer, arguably the two best known faces in Victoria. Four and twenty in gold and pastry, the great Australian pie. Each Sunday, the panel of former greats featuring names like Neil Roberts, Doug Wade, Skeeter Coglin, Bob Davis, Crackers Keenan, Bruce Andrew, Kevin Sheedy, Sam Newman, and Alan Ruthven, amongst others would dissect the previous day's matches and award votes for the major cash prize. One year, Greg Burns of St Kilda was a runaway winner and didn't poll a vote, not one, in the Brownlow. Anyway, Bob, what do you think about World of Sport over the years? Well, it's been a pleasure to be associated with the Ron. I mean, it, it hasn't been a job, it's just been a delight to be... Uh, when you when you finish with the football in the actual playing or the coaching, whatever it was, just to... Uh, be associated with the fellas that have been here, to be associated with the footballers and to be associated with sport has been tremendous and I think that probably we all owe you a you particularly a tremendous debt. Yeah. 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 World of sport was fun, but even in those days, the football clubs realised the value of the television exposure. All clubs sent in their coaches every Sunday. They would sit alongside their counterpart from the day before and be grilled by one of the experts. The interview would invariably be back page news in the paper the following day. There'd be milestone shows. The 200th was celebrated with a drink. The 1000th with a party. And still, it rolled on. By the time the 25th anniversary show went to air in July 1984, it was time to bring on the marching bands. The only problem was getting the blighters off. 25 years of all sports in just three or four hours. Oh, I don't think so, uh, Sandy. The thing I'm so happy about is just what a wonderful night it is. Uh, and I suppose it's worth 25 years of rehearsal, isn't it? It certainly is. And uh, let's... We've finally got it right. Let's hope we can get it right tonight. It was Ron Casey's baby. And it had grown from a boisterous teenager into an adult in the blink of an eye. If I could just uh, wear my other hat for a moment, I'll, I'm interested to know who approved the budget. Prizes come.